Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the conference. Um, just as a reminder, although this is called the closing plenary, it is only closing formally. There are many panels to, uh, there are many sessions for you to go to after this, which I'll go through after the um, panel discussion that we have today. And a reminder that you can share your thoughts, your reflections on the conference so far using hashtag AllianceConf, C-O-N-F 2021 on social media, and it will show up on the social media wall of the online platform that we're using. Um, I have an excellent panel um, of experts to discuss different, very different, but important and interconnected areas about how we pursue climate justice, economic justice and well-being. For this closing plenary, we'll have politically active people working hard to change views in their very different domains. We'll hear from some perspectives on linking climate justice and equity and social justice issues and critically with next steps in how we pursue economic policy in different parts of the world. I know they will provide excellent expertise and lots for us to reflect on, and I will ask that you all engage as much as possible. So um, using the discussion um, panel, it should show up on the right hand side of your screen. It all has a little tab that says questions. So please ask your questions. I will try and get through as many of them as possible. The more you ask, the more we can get out and make the most of these expert minds that we have today. We can uh, put them on the spot as much as you wish, um, all within reason, uh, to ask questions and to get the most out of them and to have to ensure that this is valuable time for you to take away practical steps uh, and ways to engage in the future. I'd like to start off by inviting Dr. Salim al -Huk. Dr. Salim al is a Bangladeshi scientist and has been the director of the International Centre for Climate Change and Development based in Bangladesh. He's also a professor at Independent University of Bangladesh. He is an expert in the field of climate change, environment and development. I'd like to welcome him to give a few reflections on the main topics of the conference today about linking climate change, well-being and equity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Talat, and, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Let me start by giving you a little bit of a background on the work that I do. I'm the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development at the Independent University Bangladesh, based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And my substantive work is on uh, working with and supporting the most vulnerable communities in some of the most vulnerable countries in Asia and Africa in particular to cope with the impacts of climate change. Um, until now, we used to think of climate change as something that will happen in the future. And what we were doing was trying to work with some of the most potentially vulnerable communities and assist them to prepare themselves to adapt to those impacts of climate change. But uh, something has happened in the last few months, in this year, in fact, that has taken us over the threshold from thinking about climate change as something that will happen in the future to something that is already happening. And the, the sixth assessment report, working group one of the scientists of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published in August of this year, has now provided us with, for the very first time, unequivocal scientific evidence that the impacts of 1.1 degree climate change that has already occurred because of human interference in the uh, global atmosphere is now having impacts, sometimes quite severe impacts in terms of uh, causing damage to people and, and harming people and causing loss of life. In the climate change parlance, we call this loss and damage from climate change. It's happening. It's not just happening in poor countries, but it's also happening in developed countries as well. Um, and we need to be cognizant of this and we need to be taking it into account and we need to be addressing it. This was an issue brought forward by the vulnerable countries in particular in Glasgow just a few days ago or weeks ago um, at COP26. Uh, we, I, I worked very closely with the group of least developed countries, some of the most vulnerable countries to the impacts of climate change and the least developed countries together with other vulnerable country groups, the small island states, the Africa group, the Latin American group, more than a hundred countries in, a, in, a, in different groups who are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change brought forward a demand in Glasgow for the Glasgow um, 
climate pact to be called the climate emergency pact. Unfortunately, the COP presidency did not agree to that. They dropped the word emergency and just call it the Glasgow uh, Climate Pact, which means uh, they didn't treat it uh, like an emergency at all. It was just a business as usual incremental progress, which is simply not sufficient. Um, however, on the issue of loss and damage in particular, even though uh, we, we, the vulnerable countries, push very hard for having a Glasgow facility, on finance for loss and damage. Uh, we weren't successful. That got watered down at the very last minute by the insistence of the United States in particular. Uh, and that has been, instead of a Glasgow facility, we now have a Glasgow dialogue. So what they've agreed to do is to talk some more. And as Greta Thunberg quite aptly puts it, they will do some more blah, blah, blah about it, but do nothing in practice about it. Uh, but having said that, very interesting development that took place in Glasgow outside the UNFCC process, the blue zone where the negotiators were, but in the city of Glasgow and in the country of uh, Scotland, uh, the Scottish government uh, through its climate uh, justice fund, which they doubled uh, at the beginning of the COP, uh, the first minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, actually announced a million pounds for a new loss and damage fund. This is the first time any leader anywhere or anybody anywhere had offered any money for loss and damage, which was the central demand from the vulnerable countries. And she challenged other leaders uh, to match that. And over the course of the two weeks that we were in Scotland, in Glasgow, um, the province of Wallonia in Belgium offered a million euros and a number of foundations offered a number of uh, a few more million as well. And at the end of the COP, uh, Nicola Sturgeon doubled the amount that Scotland had offered from 1 million to 2 million. Uh, and so we now have a pot of a few million dollars, euros and pounds uh, to start the ball rolling. And we are looking to others uh, to join uh, in terms of the funding. But even more important than getting more money is what do we do with the money? This is a major question that we, the research community to which I belong, are now going to be putting our minds to. What do we do with the money that we do have? What do we do to get more money? And what do we do with more money once we have more money? And essentially, this is acknowledging that polluters are causing harm. There are victims of pollution everywhere in all countries, including rich countries, and that the polluters have some responsibility out of a sense of uh, simply humanity and solidarity, if not liability and compensation, which we are not allowed to talk about. Those are taboo words in the UNFCC process. Um, but at least humanity and solidarity we can talk about and expect from uh, the polluting countries, polluting uh, institutions, even individuals if they want to contribute. So this is something we will be taking forward. Uh, we commend the Scottish government for initiating it. We hope the Scottish government will continue to support it going forward. I'll stop there and happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Huck. Hugely important comments that were made there. And in, in particular, I understand that you've been to every COP on the climate emergency. Could you tell me how, how inclusive or what I assume not very inclusive, the discussions and the decision making space has been around COP. You talked about, you know, over 100 countries that you were coordinating and working with who are vulnerable, who are already experiencing the dangerous consequences of climate change and who require a speedy recovery, speedy changes on uh, uh, climate justice. So can you reflect and see, has there been improvements in the level of inclusiveness around the decision making table? Well, the global governance uh, of, you know, the planet uh, reflects governance at national level in every country. Rich and powerful people make decisions on behalf of everybody and poor and vulnerable people, voices are less heard. And even when their voices are heard, they're not listened to by the rich and powerful. This is reality. Uh, this is what the world has been for many years uh, and will continue to be. Now at the global level, the only forum for all 200 uh, countries around the world to come together is the United Nations. Uh, it's not perfect. Uh, the UN Framework Convention on climate change was agreed by all countries. A few years ago in Paris, we agreed the Paris Agreement. So there have been some notable agreements and achievements, but in practice, it is very skewed 
in favor of the rich and powerful countries who are also the big polluting countries uh, to decide what gets to be done and how much gets to be done and how much does not get to be done. And the poor vulnerable countries on their own are just Im immaterial. They, their voices don't count. That's why they come together. That's why we form a group. And so 100 countries together is a significant number because there's 196 countries in the whole U UNFCC, 100 is a majority. And within the larger developing country uh, grouping of, uh, it's called the G77 in China, which is 136 countries, the 100 countries are actually a, a super majority, they're two thirds. And so their concerns are brought forward. They were brought forward in Glasgow, but they weren't taken into account the way they wanted to. And if you listen to the the voices of these countries in the final plenary, you see they were in tears. They were going home with nothing. And with the title of the conference being about um, climate justice, well-being and equity, those most marginalised, those suffering the consequences more in the global south of the actions by the global north, um, was clearly a very critical part of the conversation in COP26, but it was a conversation that was happening on the periphery, conversation happening by activists, by grassroots activists, um, often those who were locked out of a lot of the decision making. Um, and I hear that that's that is something very powerful that you've said in that you had to create your own collectivism with the 100 countries because you weren't going to get any power redistribution from the countries that are already around the decision making table really important and critical points made. Thank you, Dr. Halk. I'm going to come back to you um, as we move on to the wider panel. But for now, I'd like to introduce St uh, Stephen Gethin. Stephen served as the Member of Parliament for North East Fife from 2015 to 2019 and spent two parliamentary terms as a House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee. During his time in Parliament, Stephen served as the SNP Spokesperson on Foreign Affairs and Europe. He is currently Professor of Practice in International Relations at the University of St Andrews, which we can see in the background. Um, Stephen, I will hand over to you. Hi Tala, um, thank you so much for, for, for having me along today and thanks to everybody for coming along and, and, and for this really important discussion um, today. Um, first things first, um, this is my background, I can assure you it's not this warm and sunny in St Andrews this afternoon but it is looking beautiful and it is, it is nice and sunny if not cold. Um, thanks for that lovely introduction as, as well and press Professor practice at the School of International Relations and in Parliament um, I focused on foreign affairs, um, Europe and I was also vice chair of the all party group on climate change throughout my time in Parliament. This is a really important conference, a really important couple of days. Um, I think I've always been quite struck by the depth of work that takes place across Scotland, your reach in terms of expertise, but also your reach in different parts of the world as well. As we saw illustrated at COP26, and Dr. Hook quite rightly pointed out what was going off around in the fringes of the conference, I was, I've was i been quite struck about the skill sets, reach and insights that we have in Scotland amongst our international NGO community, our academic community and others. Um, the loss and damage um, fund that was announced by First Minister Sturgeon that Dr Hook has talked about, um, and I do not have his, his, his expertise, his depth on this, but I think it struck something really important, which was the important role that the NGO sector, the academic community, journalists have to play in all of this, that we cannot leave issues of climate well-being and equity to the decision makers and politicians, even though I've, 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 I've been one, you are driven by what goes on around you. We are not helpless in this process. And I think that was something that was illustrated by COP26. In Scotland, I think that we have an opportunity to do things slightly differently. And there's a conversation for us to be having with ourselves, with our colleagues across the United Kingdom, but also globally as well. What is our soft power? What is our branding? Um, these are conversations that are ongoing and that we always need to be having. What does a safe outward looking space look like and how can you as our um, practitioners in international development, again with your reach and expertise that others don't have in the community, be contributing to the conversation that we need to have? Dr Hook was right to point out the role of the Scottish Government had and interestingly the Walloons, but you don't need to look that much further for where sub-state actors are having a very significant impact elsewhere 
in the world. You've got the work of the under two um, group, C40, bringing together cities that's chaired by Sadiq Khan in, in London and that Susan Aitken, uh, the host of COP as a leader of Glasgow City Council, is a member of as well. And also in terms of climate justice, climate change, but also inequity and well-being, these are the people who have to implement these decisions as well. So the sub-state level is such an extraordinarily important level. But one question I've got for people in Scotland is that, yes, we have that brand and how do we maintain a brand um, internationally? What, what's it for? Um, what are our values? And here's a difficult question, actually. I think we're good at some things but we can't be good at everything. What is our added value? Where do we show leadership? Is it in climate diplomacy, in mediation, or higher education sector? Is it in areas like a feminist foreign policy, which is increasingly being discussed and looked into? And what does that mean and what is its impact? It was good to see the thought leadership, and I come back to Dr. Hook's remarks previously about the loss and damage. But this is a start of a conversation. That was the start of a conversation. And it was great that we had that announcement. It was great to see leadership from our friends and colleagues in Wallonie, as well as those from the Scottish government. But this is just a start. Now, the UK as a whole is at a crossroads. Um, the, the, the past few years of Brexit, um, the legacy of the pandemic, and the climate emergency mean that the next few years will be crucial. There's no such thing as a political status quo when it comes to international development policy, when it comes to climate change policy. So where do we lead and where do you, because I'm, I'm throwing that out there to the people who are attending this conference, start to provide thought leadership. We can't hang around and wait for the politicians to provide that leadership. It's great when they do, but we're all part of this together. Um, just as a final thing, and I hope that the organisers won't mind me saying this, I wrote a book last year on Scotland's foreign policy footprint, um, and I'm writing a second edition at the moment. But what really struck me when I was writing that book was that people across the political spectrum, those who believe in independence, those who believe in remaining in the UK, those who believe in leaving the EU, those who believe in remaining in the EU, those for whom the climate change is the immediate and most important issue, which I think um, most politicians now agree on, agree that Scotland has a foreign policy footprint, and part of that is because of the work that all of those who are attending this conference um, do. So how do we harness that? How do we collect that? And that's a debate and discussion which lies at the heart of ensuring that the next five or ten years of policy debate and discussion can be a success. Now, I've tried to do a very quick overview. There's so much in here. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have, or also please feel free to send me your more private comments as well. I'd love to have them. Thank you. You mentioned their uh, priorities um, and you mentioned, you know, higher and further education. You mentioned the um, uh, feminist foreign policy. Uh, you, you provide a list there. In your view, what do you think, using that soft power and understanding that Scotland can't do everything, what do you see as priorities that can be most effective and make the most impact for Scotland? Um, Scotland's a country of about five and a half million. It's a sub-state actor. If you look at other sub-state actors, or even if you look at independent countries of about five and a half million, they prioritise. You can't do everything. You can't have the reach of the UK. You certainly can't have the reach of the United States. That means collaboration with other like-minded states becomes really important. The EU becomes important, but you have to specialise. I think that um, we need to specialise. Climate change is the biggest issue that any of us are facing. It trumps everything. It is the biggest issue. Yesterday, I noticed that um, we gave an honorary degree at the University of St Andrews to Andrew Marr, who's about to leave the Andrew Marr programme. And he is somebody who's been a journalist of politics for over 40 years, said, 100 years from now, what will be the big issue that people will be discussing? It will be COP26 and its legacy. So climate change is the number one issue. So we need to find our niche there. Is that in climate diplomacy? Is that in loss and damage? Or is that also um, to be found in our research experience and expertise? But there are other areas. I think we can be a hub for mediation. Increasingly, you're seeing areas that are affected by, by conflict using Scotland as a safe space. And um, that's something that you need to position yourselves. It's something the Norwegians do very well, but there aren't many countries that do that. And Scotland has increasing expertise, um, actually been driven by a number of our groups, our international development groups. Also, and you mentioned there, Talat, feminist foreign policy. 
I think there's a huge discussion to be had around that, especially as we draw on from the experiences of the pandemic. The pandemic has been dreadful. It's been devastating in terms of loss of life and driving inequality, but it's happened. And therefore, where do we draw the, the good examples out of that? Where do we derive from um, that devastation, some of the good lessons that we've learned and critically some of the cultural lessons that we've learned. So in climate change and climate diplomacy and research, on mediation and the feminist foreign policy, I think there are a number of areas we can start to have a discussion around where we prioritise. Well, for those who know me, Paul, I'm always going to be a fan of anybody who calls for feminist foreign policy. So looking forward to more of those conversations as well. And I think it's I think it's absolutely right. COVID-19 has illustrated um, not just when it comes to um, the experiences of women, but also disabled people, LGBT communities, uh, working class communities, black, Asian, minority ethnic communities, marginalized and indigenous communities across the world, how surface level our progress towards equality was and how the pandemic has illustrated who is harmed the most and first through the decisions that we make and any crisis of whatever kind um, occurs. I just want to say that we were due to have, um, I believe, um, Steve Letsicki, who um, has had some problems with internet connections. So we're hoping to get her back on, but he's chair of Commonwealth Equality Network, an inclusive network that promotes cooperation, understanding and solidarity among diverse LGBTI plus organisations to collectively defend the rights and equalities of LGD LGBTI people throughout the Commonwealth. Now, um, they were on and they've dropped off again. So we will hopefully, and this is the, the uh, problem with anything that's online and live, but we will hope to do what we can to get them back on. Um, for now, let's invite back Dr. Huck and um, Stephen, Geth Stephen Gethins, and we will have answered some questions that we have had through so far. So thank you so much for your inputs. Um, We've had first one question, um, it's directed to yourself, Dr. Huck, but I think, um, Stephen, you have an important role to play in this answer as well, so I will pose it to both of you. How would you recommend that the Scottish Government aligns its commitments to international development and its commitment to financially address climate loss and damage? Um, I'll go to you first, Dr. Huck. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Talat, and, and thank you to the questioner. Um, let me uh, preface my answer by saying that um, you mentioned at the beginning, I've been to all 26 COPs. And uh, one, one thing I say about the Scottish COP in Glasgow was that it was both a, a bad COP inside the negotiations, particularly on the issue of loss and damage uh, for the, from the perspective of the most vulnerable countries, which is what I am always concerned most about. Uh, but it was a very, very successful COP outside what was called the blue zone with the UN you know, the guards surrounding it and only people with badges being allowed in. Uh, in the city of Glasgow and in the country of Scotland, uh, we were very well received. We had a very good time, uh, a grand time, in fact, uh, as, uh, um, as people uh, being welcomed by the citizens of Glasgow and Scotland. And indeed, the government of Scotland, as I've mentioned already, did a very uh, provocative and, and uh, forward-looking act and has done this for some time now. It wasn't just bandwagon jumping with COP26 being in Glasgow. The government of Scotland has had a climate justice fund for a number of years now. It's one of the first climate justice funds that in existence anywhere. And the government of Scotland doubled that fund and part of it then uh, was put into this new loss and damage fund uh, that I mentioned earlier. These are very far reaching and bold decisions that the First Minister of Scotland and the Government of Scotland did. And uh, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon very kindly invited me to her residence in Edinburgh the day the COP after the COP ended uh, to talk about what to do next. And she's very much committed to bringing Scotland forward in terms of reaching out to other uh, sub-state actors and other actors, as I said, foundations have put money on the table. And we talked about potentially having Scotland uh, host another meeting later in next year before COP27 to bring together the actors who are working in this space on loss and damage. Now that uh, Scotland has taken the lead in initiating a coalition of actors, both government as well as non-government research site
society that would benefit from joining forces and coming together. And, and we are very hopeful that she will continue to take the lead. The Scottish government will continue to take the lead. Scottish civil society will continue to take the lead. This, is, this issue is just beginning. It did not end in COP26. It will not end in COP27. It will continue for the rest of our lifetimes. And you have initiated something very significantly. And I would um, recommend very strongly that the government and the people of Scotland make the story of COP26 what they did and not what Mr. Johnson did not do inside the COP. Thank you very much. Stephen, can I go to you? Uh, the question, just to remind uh, the audience, um, is how would you recommend that the Scottish Government aligns its commitment to international development with its commitment to financing, financially address climate loss and damage? So it's a good question. Um, I think, first of all, what I'm going to say, and just pick up what Dr Hook said at the very, very end there, when he talked about what is the story post-COP, and actually I think that's a story that we have responsibility to, to, to write, and that's a, a story that is yet to be written. I think increasingly important, and that's why this call is so important, um, with apologies to people from Glasgow, and I'm not from Edinburgh, um, and I'm not from Glasgow, but I'm, with apologies to those from Glasgow who are on this call, I'm going to say, post-COP26, you need to learn something from Edinburgh, and that's which a very unpopular thing to say, so I'm going to split everybody down the middle on that, first of all. What is this? If you look at the way the Edinburgh Fringe Festival emerged over the years. Um, for, for those of you who know the Edinburgh festivals, the international festivals, the festival itself has actually become a smaller and smaller known and, and less significant part of what happens in the Edinburgh festival. And the fringe has become such an important part of that festival. And I noticed that at COP26 when I went there, that the fringe around it was increasingly important, whereby the NGO community, academic community, but also many of the um, societies that were most affected by climate change weren't hanging around and waiting for the the, the big boys, and it was often boys, the big boys um, to for leadership. They were doing it themselves. And that happened at a governmental level. It was so impressive seeing representatives like the lady from the Marshall Islands just getting stuck in. Um, and so what we do now and how we tell the story and what climate loss and damage means is something for us all to do now. Secondly, on a Scottish government level, I, I think, and I'm going to tie this into the pandemic, what are we doing now that's different from the start of the pandemic? One of the biggest challenges in politics is um, cultural change. So you can talk about stuff in politics all you like, but if the population out there isn't with you or they don't care very much, it makes it very, very difficult. Political leadership only goes so far. So I think what would be interesting um, to look at are the behavioural changes that we're still learning that have kicked in from the pandemic um, that we take forward. Look at this conference we're having today. Great conference, fantastic people. It'd be great to see you all in person, but actually we're able to bring people in from around the world to talk to us without all actually having to be in the same room. That's just one small example, but also we need to understand the inequalities. So for example, in the classroom, the kids who are struggling around a kitchen table in a small, badly heated, um, house, how do we help them? And I'll just, finally, we need to tie in with these domestic challenges. So for example, a few years ago when the Scottish Government looked at energy efficiency to meet its climate targets under the 2009 Act, yes, it met the climate tar um, targets, but the target was poor housing and inequality because you could hit fuel efficiency and fuel poverty at the same time as hitting your climate targets. So how do we mould policy so that climate runs through everything? Excellent point. Actually, it um, reflects some of the points made yesterday about policy coherence and not siloing the issue of equality, not siloing the issue of, of climate change and climate justice somewhere else. Rather, it needs to be threaded through all policy initiatives, all systems that we have. Uh, and too often we have siloed this issue as either for someone else or a different department. So I think that's a, a point well made. You mentioned, both of you mentioned there, particularly Dr. Huck, you mentioned uh, civil society, third sector, charities, grassroots. And we have a question here, which is about um, the need for a strong civil society, third sector, which is active, engaged and informed on climate justice and international sustainable development, which will be a key asset in supporting and leading our society to make changes. 
What do you think would help support that third sector in Scotland and beyond? Because we have um, uh, participants from all over the world here. How do you think a, a third sector civil society can be sustained, supported to be able to do some of that work um, as a key influencer on both climate justice and international development? Stephen, if I come to you first to give a Scotland perspective and then uh, Dr Huck, a yeah. Scotland and white perspective. So from a Scottish perspective, and look, I know it's easy for me to say this, and it's hard. And, and Talat, I was looking at you. I'm going to refer to your social media, and I'm and and and, and I saw something, but really good, right? I saw something really good. I, I, I saw a call pinned on your Twitter saying to the media out there, "Don't just take the same old faces. Don't just take you know have a diversity in the kind of people that 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 that." that you're listening to have a diversity in the kind of voices that you're hearing. Now, the reason I really liked that was, and sorry to refer to you, because it's not about you, it's about everybody else who's, 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 who's out there, but you're in the position of chairing, is that you have to say to everybody, you cannot hang around and wait to have this argument. You cannot hang around and wait for the opportunities to come up. One of the benefits that we've got in Scotland, and I noticed this in London, and look, there are benefits of being in London, there are benefits of being in Scotland, but here's from a Scottish perspective. Um, we're quite small. It's not that difficult to find people who know, who know one another. Um, sometimes we can be a bit too small, um, but sometimes the size is quite nice because stakeholders by and large know each other. Decision makers and people in places of influence, be it in industry, um, be it in education, be it in government, be it in parliament, um, aren't that difficult to reach. So our networks being a little bit smaller become a little bit easier. So that's why I was so pleased to see yours because sometimes I feel that we do get the same voices and that's why I challenge others just sharpen your elbows and get stuck in and I know that's not always easy and it's hard and sometimes you'll feel that you're banging your head off a brick wall and you're not making any progress you are making progress keep at it so that and use the networks we've got small networks and that can be a huge benefit sometimes as well. Uh, I think I did get a little bit of fear when you mentioned my Twitter feed, but I think I've been largely professional on it, so <laughs> thank you. Um, Dr. Huck, can I come to you? Sure, thank you very much, Talat. So let me start from the global, but I will also make a, a final a little remark on Scotland as well. Uh, at the global level, you know, my role in the COPs, and as I said, I've been to all of them, but I go not as a negotiator, I go as a representative of civil society. I'm a, I'm a researcher, I'm a professor in a university. I advise the least developed countries in the negotiations, but they are the ones who negotiate. I don't negotiate on their behalf. So I see my role very much at these global events as a voice of civil society inside the tent, because I have access to the inside of that particular tent. And so um, the role of civil society is extremely important every single COP, including in Glasgow, uh, where uh, thousands of people from all over the world, indigenous groups from all over the world, youth groups from all over the world, academics like myself from all over the world, uh, and so on and so forth, had come together in the tens of thousands from all over the world. They were networking, they were uh, talking to each other, they were figuring out ways to do things together. And to me, that is really the story of Glasgow. And we need to make that the legacy of Glasgow, in fact, as well, going forward. And, and let me end by just saying a little bit about personal experience in Scotland and in Glasgow. We have a significant, you know, Bangladeshi Scottish community based in Scotland, in both Edinburgh and Glasgow, uh, who came to the fore. You know, they invited us all out. We met with them. They did events that we participated in. Uh, and not just Bangladeshi, by the way, broader South Asian as well. Um, they are British, they are Scottish, they are South Asian at the same time. And that is actually a very big asset, in fact, for Scotland that I would say that needs to be tapped into uh, in your future you know, foreign policy, your future development policy, and indeed your future climate change and climate justice policy. That's a big asset, you know, uh, the, and particularly the younger generation, the young people of uh, South Asian origin are extremely interested in this. You know, they're not interested in what their parents were interested in back home, but they are interested in climate change. I can tell you, I've spoken to many young uh, South Asians in the UK more broadly, as well as in Scotland, and, and there's a lot of interest there. Thank you, Dr. Huck. 
And I can I can attest to that in the conversations that I'm having between my South Asian migrant parents and myself and the generational difference in understanding the, the, the protection of planet and people rather than growth, which coming from a community where the growth didn't exist, the uh, and disasso disassociation from growth and purchase and money being what's, what is the example of success, but rather collectivism, solidarity and community being the um, example of success. Um, I have a question here for both of you again. How do we ensure that the trade-offs between domestic policy outcomes and the unintended negative global impacts they cause are talked about honestly by politicians in Scotland, but also the global north. So thinking of trade impacts, so whilst we talk about uh, COP26, whilst Scotland was the first to um, put in um, a fund for loss and damage, but at the same time supporting certain polluting industries, for example, uh, oil and gas, how do we um, ensure that that trade-off does not create unintended negative global impacts? And how do we have a more honest, challenging conversation about that in Scotland and in the global north. Uh, Dr. Huck, I'll come to you first. Uh, sure, this is a, a very good question and in fact something that everybody who is interested in development generally globally uh, needs to address. I think one of the key, if you like, turning points that climate change brings to the development discourse between north and south uh, that we have had for many decades uh, post-colonial history uh, is that we are now uh, in the same world. Global climate change is going to affect everybody. Those of you living in Scotland, those of us living in Bangladesh, all of us are going to be affected, not equally. Some will be affected more and some uh, uh, less, but everybody's going to be affected. It's truly a planetary scale problem, like few other problems are. Uh, um, COVID-19 is another good example of planetary scale. Everybody on the planet is being affected and therefore collective action by everybody on the planet, on the one hand represented by governments of these countries, but also represented by citizens themselves. And so in my view, one of the big mindset changes that we need to be doing, and that's where I, I come back to the younger generation everywhere in all countries, is thinking of each of ourselves as citizens of planet Earth and citizens of Scotland or Bangladesh or whatever. And the first being overarching over the second. You know, being a citizen of our country and our city and our village is important, but being a citizen of the entire planet is also very important. And young people actually do get it. You know, the school kids who are striking every Friday and come out every Friday, they are connected like never before across the world. There are millions of them, every school in every country uh, all over the planet. Uh, and that's to me a, 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 a harbinger of the way forward. And I think of them as our leaders and not the the old uh, boys leaders who met in Glasgow inside the blue zone uh, a few weeks ago, their, their meeting uh, did not produce what we needed, but the young kids will do it in future. Certainly the um, Friday strikes are a huge source of hope, seeing young people come together right across the world um, and be connected in that way. Stephen, can I come to you? Yeah. So. I have to say one nice thing about working in a university environment sometimes is the way in which um, respectful discussion and debate often on very difficult topics is something that is en encouraged. What's been really good, and I saw this with the climate strikes, is the way in which students and younger generations are, as Dr. Hooks just referenced, coming out and having a really good, honest, open discussion about this um, in a way that's really refreshing and encouraging. So I'm going to say something a wee bit provocative and difficult to people listening, because I think this conversation is a difficult one. It should be a difficult one. Um, there are trade-offs. If you're in politics, you're not just there to represent one sector, one industry, you're there to represent everybody. I think about going back to 2011, 2012. Um, 2012 with the climate justice introduction and Scotland's world leadership. I remember actually going off and talking about fairness at home and overseas, and I remember Alex Salmon, for, for instance, going off and having a difficult conversation in Beijing at the Communist School of China. I think he, he, he made a speech about fairness and human rights being an integral part of it. And on the renewable side of it, and, the, and trying to seek, as, as we've done, that 100% uh, 
renewables of our electricity sector, decarbonising the electricity sector in Scotland. Who did you talk to? Well, yes, you talked to the activists and those who'd been pushing this agenda. But you also spoke to the oil and gas industry. You spoke to the academic sector. And what's really important here is this conversation needs to be had across. If, 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 if climate change and fairness is to go through every element of policy, then it needs to go through every policy discussion. And I'll say something challenging to people who are here. I think that if you want to have a serious conversation, you need to reach out to the oil and gas industry. You need to reach out to academics. You need to think about the impact that this will have on communities, say, in the, 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 the northeast of Scotland. That's why the northeast of Scotland transition fund. And sometimes when you have difficult conversations with people who have a different perspective, you learn something. In fact, you always learn something because it gives you a slightly different perspective. So my message would be go out and have the difficult conversations and lead those difficult conversations. You might be surprised about how much you learn. I know I'm surprised every time I speak to somebody that disagrees with me, actually. It's, it's always refreshing. Thank you both. We have a question here that reflects on um, the conversations we've had yesterday and today about decolonisation um, and um, embedding in um, a more just, anti-oppressive way in which we deliver international development. And the question asks, international development actors have long been involved in security sector reform initiatives. How do we see conversations around decolonising the sector linking to prison and policing abolitionist movements? Stephen, if I can go to you first. Wow, right, okay. It's a really good question. I've got to think about it. Um, so one of the things you can do is maintain the spotlight on things. That's something that we can do here at home. Don't let things slip off. Don't be uncomfortable about what's, what's going on. I think one of the biggest things you can do though, and I say you for people who are in this call, how are we helping cultivate expertise um, amongst their partners. You know, the, the, the expertise does just not exist in Scotland um, and elsewhere. The expertise exists elsewhere. And actually, how are we learning from our partners elsewhere so we can see how we can do things better? So I think having that equal um, conversation. In terms of security sector reform, um, this is a sector that I, I worked in years ago, but I'm less on top of it now. I know Police Scotland at Tilly Kutry have been doing some, um, some work on this. And I'd love to think about areas where Scots can do a little bit more work, but it needs to be focused and it needs to be um, specialised. And again, don't duck the difficult questions. You know, don't duck what's going on in Belarus or Russia right in our doorsteps. Don't duck the difficult conversations on the refugee crisis, which is just as much part of um, our crisis and our humanity as it is for um, anybody else. So I, I don't have a huge amount on, on, on this one and I'd have to think about it an awful lot more, but this is a discussion that I'm, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to have in the future as well. Thank you. Dr. Huck, can I come to you? It's a, a difficult but important question. Sure. So let me um, take a, an attempt at it from the perspective that I work on, which is in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, on climate change and loss and damage. In fact, under the issue of loss and damage uh, in the UN Framework Convention is the sub-issue of human displacement because of climate change. What we in normal parlance call climate migrants or climate refugees. Neither of those two terms are recognized in the UNFCC, by the way. Uh, but displacement because of climate change is. And this is a growing concern because we all know that climate change is going to cause more migration everywhere around the world. And so this issue, a security issue of migration that existed before climate change is going to get hugely exacerbated by climate change. And unless we take it much, much more seriously than we had before, it's going to overwhelm us everywhere. Um, and I think, you know, again, Scotland has a, a particular, uh, you know, forward looking uh, op position to hold within the United Kingdom and then more broadly across countries in Europe as well, to be more humane in, in treating this issue and not be inhumane as, you know, at least from our side of the, the spectrum, it looks like <laughs> in some of the debates that take place on this issue uh, uh, from uh, the developed country side. You know, let me cite you an example 
the few hundreds of migrants that are crossing the channel right now from France into the UK is causing a huge amount of media furor. In Bangladesh, we accepted and looked after one million migrants that were thrown out of Myanmar because they were Muslims. We are looking after them. We are a very poor country ourselves, but we are looking after them. They are not dying. They are not being pushed back. They are being looked after. You know, humanity goes a long way. Absolutely, and humanity within um, UK government policy around immigration and the Home Office is certainly something that is required um, and has been a, a very difficult place for those who are human rights activists and migrants rights activists to be pushing, um, uh, particularly the UK government, on their position. We have another uh, question here. Um, this is from Benjamin who said, I've spent most of the past two months in Bangladesh. Many stakeholders don't immediately recognize the relevance of climate to their lives. Many consider it to be something impacting the poorest and only of interest to big players. Without adopting a colonialist or paternalistic approach, which we don't want to do, how can Scotland, including Alliance members, help to engage all stakeholders in the Global South on the climate emergency? And actually add to that for Stephen as well, there is a, it's happening to someone else mindset in Scotland too, um, in the general population. How do we overcome that whilst also having conversations and engaging stakeholders in the Global South? Um, yeah. If you don't mind, I'll come to Dr. Huck first to talk about Bangladesh. Sure. So thank you very much. And thank you, Ben, for that question. I, I would say, you know, if you ask people in Bangladesh about climate change and, you know, mitigation, adaptation, UNFCC, COPS, they may not know very much about it. But climate, they do know. Every time there's a flood, they're affected. Every time there's heavy downpour of rain in Dhaka City, we are all affected. Uh, every time there's a cyclone in the coastal zone, we are affected. So we know about climate. Bangladeshis know about climate, the reality of climatic events, extreme events. We have been facing them and we will continue to face them and it does affect us. Um, however, on the issue of climate change, let me also uh, offer uh, my view, which is counter to yours, in terms of the awareness level of the Bangladeshi public. Not everybody necessarily, but quite a large, large number of the public are actually aware. And I'll give you one indicator of that. While we were in Glasgow uh, at the COP, at the beginning of the COP, the first two days was a very big you know, show with Prime Minister Johnson and leaders from all over the world flying in, giving speeches, and then leaving that he drew huge global media attention for a couple of days. And then the media disappeared and we had the COP, the Conference of Parties negotiations for another two weeks. And then the media came back at the very end uh, to report on the outcomes of the COP. But for two weeks, there was a lot of very detailed negotiations going on where the media were really not following it. At least global media was not, some specialized media were. But in Glasgow at that time, over those two weeks, there were three private television channels from Bangladesh, private channels at their own expense had sent crews to Glasgow who were reporting back to Bangladesh to their audience, a general Bangladeshi audience. Every single day, they were doing a live report on what happened today. Who said what? What did the UK say? What did America say? What happened on this? What happened on that? They were following the negotiations in detail every single day and broadcasting that to a wide public in Bangladesh who are following the negotiations in Glasgow every single day. Now, it not, may not be everybody in Bangladesh, but it was a wide public because these pri private television channels would not have invested their own money in reporting it if they didn't feel that there was a public desire for this information and a high level of public awareness of what was happening in Glasgow, much higher than I would say many citizens of Scotland or even the United Kingdom on the details of what was happening in Glasgow during those two weeks. So um, I would say by and large, Bangladeshi awareness is very high. You know, not everybody, obviously, if, if Ben spoke to people who didn't show that awareness, obviously that, that, that belies what I said, but I'd say by and large, the awareness is very high. Thank you, Dr. Huck. Um, and important to clarify, just the, the, the awareness is high because the damages and the consequences are being felt by them on a daily basis. Right. Stephen, can I come to you, please? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a really good question. Um, I think this has to be an integral part of our 
domestic discussion. So let's focus on our domestic discussion a wee bit first, because that has an impact elsewhere. Um, we're in a world whereby we've never felt further apart but closer together at the same time, further apart, and that when you see vaccine inequalities and ability to meet up and, 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 and we're affected by the pandemic and by poverty and, and by the climate even in very, very distinctive ways. However, we also have the pandemic and the climate absolutely in common. If we think about the pandemic, and I, I think it's impossible over the next few years to have a conversation about anything without referencing the um, the impact of the climate, which, which has impacted every single human being on Earth, and they know it's been impacted by them. Similarly, this was something, I don't know if you all think back in the dim and distant past of December 2019, when we're picking up on the news of this new, um, this, this new virus that had been picked up in Wuhan in China. And so something that happened in a market in Wuhan in China, two or three months later, you know, was having a very significant impact in our lives. So something like this in history has never happened before with that proximity. So I think we need to um, have a discussion about how do we um, combine a response to them both um, and I think that the, that sometimes the, the, the response is in terms of how does how does that tie into inequality? How does it tie into educational provision? How does it tie into industry and keeping people in jobs? These are not separate discussions. This is one big integral discussion. So the discussion that we are having in Scotland, there will be similarities with discussion that's happening in Bangladesh. And one of the nice things about using this platform and talking to each other is there'll be things that they're thinking about and doing in Bangladesh that we're not doing in Scotland yet. So that's where this connectivity becomes really important and trying to learn lessons from um, one another. And the people who are on this call um, are better placed than most to be telling that story, telling that story when they're working with partners, but also telling that story at, at, at home in areas where you think we can be learning from everybody else as well. I can think that's a point well made. Uh, too often global north countries and nations are um, not uh, equipped or eager enough to take lessons from the global south where they are actually doing significantly better than us. And that includes on COVID-19 um, and recovery and distribution and um, health messaging as well. So hearing from that learning from the global south is critical and something that we need to learn from more. I have a question for you both that is specifically on power redistribution. So, you know, we talk about Scotland's position and what it can do in terms of the um, loss and damage um, fund that it's created. But there's also a question here about what is Scotland's role in um, outwardly challenging Global North nations in their lack of action and pushing them to redistribute their power so that the 100 countries and more that you are working with, Dr Huck, actually have access to power. What is What can be Scotland's role in pushing, exemplifying power redistribution and challenging other nations to do better and also leading by example because we can do better on that ourselves as well. Dr Huck, if I come to you. Sure, thank you very much. That's an extremely uh, uh, pertinent question. And let me just share with you a little bit of my perception of what happened uh, in, in Glasgow, particularly after First Minister Nicola Sturgeon put that one million on the table. She not only put the money on the table, she actually put a challenge on the table for other leaders to match it and accept that and, and her, her words are very powerful words. I'll, I'll remind you of them. She said that Scotland was where the birth of the Industrial Revolution took place. And Scotland and the United Kingdom were beneficiaries of that Industrial Revolution over the last century and a half. And during that period had produced greenhouse gases, which are now causing problems around the world. Uh, and, and they recognize that. And the money that she put on the table, uh, uh, one million, it's not a huge amount, but it is an extremely important symbolic amount, was as a reparation, as a recognition. This was not charity. It's not development assistance. It is reparation. It is, the, that's the word she used. And she challenged other countries that have benefited from the Industrial Revolution to do the same. Now, we heard that the uh, the sub-state uh, uh, level in Belgium, Wallonia, actually responded. Uh, but I can also tell you that a number of the countries in the European Union also were taken up by that challenge. You know, they are concerned by that challenge because they are not offering a single penny. 
you know, countries like Denmark, countries like Ireland, countries like Germany. Uh, well, the UK, I would put in the, in, in the same bucket as the US. They refuse to talk about this. So the US are the extreme position. They refuse to talk about this issue. Uh, but there is a spectrum of other leaders who uh, are, can be shamed into accepting some level of responsibility. And I hope that uh, Scotland's example uh, will be something that we can continue to use to bring other leaders on board. Stephen, can I come to you about power redistribution and Scotland's role in, in, in challenging what other nations are doing and who has access to power particularly? So I think first of all, as a sub-state actor in this, for the time being, you know, some people might say some, some not, but let's, let's focus on being a sub-state actor at the moment. I think you can show and provide leadership that there's plenty you can do if you're not an international actor. Why did everybody, you know, Glasgow was packed um, a couple of weeks ago. Why did they all bother to make the journey? Because even if, you know, and didn't just leave it up to Joe Biden, President Xi, um, and um, Emmanuel Macron and others. It's because you can make an influence, be you a sub-state actor or be you at, um, an NGO or as a non-state actor. Um, you can also show leadership. And I think, you know, politics is hard. Governing is hard. You can do things sometimes and provide leadership more quickly um, than, say, at a state level. So I think providing that thought leadership. But where that gets hard is, first of all, what happens three months from now when we're not discussing it, when the headlines have long gone, when the world has moved on to whatever else it is. So it's keeping that conversation alive becomes really difficult. I'd also say from a Scottish perspective, the sub-state level as we've illustrated is important and working with partners is important, but don't let the state level off the hook. Remember that um, as Scottish organisations, your tax dollars, if, if, if you like, go to the UK, which represents you at a foreign office level. Keep up the pressure, keep talking to the MPs, keep talking to the UK government um, as well. You are making a difference. Believe me, you're making a difference. So um, I think that there's a lot of leadership that we can do in Scotland. We need to go further and we need to show a lot more innovation. We need to keep the conversation going. But it's not a conversation we can be having alone. And so we need to have that conversation um, with the UK government as, 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 as well as our partners in the rest of Europe too, where we can have some influence. My last question for you is to think about the uh, audience and the delegates that we have here. How do we maintain momentum up to COP27? How do we maintain momentum? And critically, how is that momentum maintained on the focus of this conference? Marginalised voices at the centre power redistribution and the, those furthest away from access to power, opportunity and wealth and those most harmed and, uh, and, and facing the consequences of, of uh, climate change being at the centre. How do we maintain momentum around that? Stephen, if I go to you first and then um, Dr. Huck. This isn't easy. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier on in response to one of the, the answers. It's frustrating, but you need to sharpen your elbows and get stuck in. So you need to be on about, you know, these issues, why they're important. Also, and this is a difficult conversation for everybody, but as you all understand, try not to do everything. I'm not saying this as, as an organisation, I'm saying this for, 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 for the individuals who are there. What is your expertise? What is your niche? Why should people be listening to you? What have you got to say? And the other thing is that's really, really important. Don't just say it once, keep saying it. The UK has got um, presidency of COP up until November next year. So make full use of that opportunity and the fact that we still have and keep the legacy of Glasgow um, alive and use the excuse, but focus in on what you do well, what's your niche and try and think about why on earth should people be listening to you in particular. I know they should be, but you need to be able to tell your own story as well. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Huck. Thank you very much, Philip. So let me uh, just say, uh, start with a little bit about the next COP, COP27 which will be hosted in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt in November, 2022. Now, Egypt has already declared this as an African COP. It will be putting forward the concerns of the African countries, particularly the most vulnerable countries in Africa. And indeed, they've said it's not just the African vulnerable countries, but all vulnerable countries, including those in Asia and Latin America and, and the small islands, etc. So uh, we look to Egypt to be a much fairer, 
COP presidency than the UK was on these issues. I, I must say the UK let us down on these particular issues that we brought to Glasgow and we had high hopes in Glasgow. Uh, and so we are looking to Egypt to be much more proactive on these particular issues of the most vulnerable and climate justice and injustice issues related to that. Very specifically on the topic of loss and damage, we expect Egypt will be taking this very seriously as well. And I believe that this is really the issue for Scotland, as opposed to the UK, to take forward. You are the ones who put this forward. Your government and your civil society were the ones who did this. Make this your legacy. Make this something that you build on and take forward and continue to... I, I call the money that Scotland put forward, the one million that has now grown to several million, as the beginning of a snowball. Let us push this snowball and make it bigger and bigger and bigger in reality uh, and make it a very significant outcome of what happened in Glasgow. May not be an official COP output, but it is a legacy of Glasgow and of our meeting in Scotland and what the people of Scotland and the government of Scotland took forward and made happen uh, in November 2021. But it is a legacy that I, I believe you are in a position to build on and take forward. And as Stephen says, focus on something, focus on loss and damage. I think you, you have established your flag on that. Don't let it go. <laughs> A huge thank you to you both, um, Dr. Samuel, uh, Salim Ul Huck and Professor Stephen Gethins. I hugely appreciate your expertise and time, um, and thank you for answering all those questions. I know we had a couple more, but we weren't able to answer them all. So thank you so much for your time uh, and for taking part in the conference. Um, I do want to share that we did uh, try to get uh, Steve Letziki um, on. Um, I'm afraid she did have, she did try, she persevered many times, but she was having connection issues and power issues where she was, so she was unable to join. However, um, we will try and get some content that will be available on the platform that you're using now um, to be able to be recorded and for you to watch on demand as you would like. So i just like to finish off by saying uh, again, uh, this whilst this is a closing um, plenary, it is only an official closing, it's not the real closing, because uh, online there are more sessions for you to participate in, including um, there is also the uh, session on uh, ethical photography, uh, collaborating for development, research on well-being and sustainable development bill, um, and of course yoga on demand. So you are able to participate in all of those uh, on using the online platform, so please continue to do that. Also use the discussion forum um, to be able to chat to one another, and you can continue to use the um, social media hashtag, hashtag AllianceConfConf2021. Uh, I'd also like to remind you that all the sessions are going to be recorded and you'll be able to continue having access on them on the swap card platform until February 2022. So if at any point you forget the challenges, actions, ideas that we have discussed here over day one and day two, you're able to come back all the way through to February to be able to engage in that. Please remember to share your thoughts and feedback on the conference using the link in the chat function. The link is also shared with you via the platform notification system. You can fill in the survey directly on the platform. It's an accessible, accessible from the button on the top navigation panel. Uh, and don't forget, there's also the Alliance Conference Quiz. If you haven't done so already, there is a prize involved. If you haven't done it already, why not? Um, I will also um, just let you know that, uh, again, the conference doesn't happen without sponsors and support. So um, StoneX, WaterAid, Challenges Group, um, Chris Hoskins and the exhibition, Chris Hoskins Photography, Climate Challenges Programme Malawi, Ecology, a Youth Trust, Centre for Climate Justice at Glasgow Caledonian University, Link Education International and Mishwar and Send a Cow. You can talk to any of them throughout the um, time that you are using the online platform. You can use a little chat function, click on their icon and talk to them directly. So please do engage with them too. Thank you so much for taking part in the um, taking part in this uh, conference. I hope you will continue to participate in the other uh, sessions that we have going. Um, in particular, um, I'd like to thank you for having um, challenging conversations that speak not simply about climate justice as a siloed issue or as well-being economy as a siloed issue, but instead threading together the reality of marginalised communities and the experiences for marginalised communities um, across the world. And why, why power sharing, particularly redistribution, 
uh, needs to take place for us to be able to come up with the solutions for climate justice and a well-being economy that, mar that centres marginalised voices and centres the lives of those who are furthest away from access to opportunity, power and wealth. Um, I've just been given a message that says that, um, actually Steve may be available, uh, Steve may be available, so let me just bear with me one second whilst we check and we can maybe get some, her opening remarks at least, to be able to get her to participate. Okay, um, so we won't be able to, it's unlikely we'll be able to take questions, but I would like to, if possible, hear some opening remarks. So Steve, can I welcome you to the conference? I'm sorry that you've had problems with getting online. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that it won't have been won't have been easy, but I so appreciate your perseverance. Most people would have probably stopped trying. I appreciate you trying um, and, and getting back online. So, what would be great is if we could hear from you um, and just your opening remarks in the few minutes that we've got left, because what you have to say is critical in terms of the LGBTI. LGBTQI plus community and ensuring yeah. that um, their voices are heard in the solutions that we capture. Thank you. No, no, indeed. Thank you so much, uh, Talat. And, and I really do apologize. We're suffering quite severe load sheddings uh, in South Africa. And in fact, I think it's actually fitting Talat for this conversation, because if our government does not even sort out the energy process uh, in switching from using coal, we will still suffer what we are having uh, uh, completely, which is also affecting the environment and the climate completely. So, so let me take this opportunity to really thank you uh, for inviting me into this space. Um, you know, climate change uh, uh, program and equality program affects LGBTI persons. And as we know, in the Commonwealth uh, countries, uh, we still have a, 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 a sort of uh, quite a lot of 50 uh, countries that still uh, which are 51 countries actually that still criminalize homosexual act uh, if you take countries in the pacific island in the caribbean and in many of uh, uh, european and even the the african uh, uh, countries uh, here in my region i am in africa uh, we have 31 countries that still criminalize homosexual act, and I'm happy to announce that Botswana two days ago dismissed the uh, 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 Auditor General appeal uh, of the decrim, and Botswana is one that just recently decrimed, uh, uh, decriminalized homosexual act. But the reason why I'm raising this is that we cannot think the environment, particularly climate, is disconnected to addressing human rights issues uh, uh, on, and how they are applied. So the legal environment is quite critical. The, the social environment is quite critical. We need to think through how do we look at elements that strengthen the resilience within countries that we occupy uh, that really is uh, uh, experiencing negative impacts of both climate or even uh, uh, human rights. Without rights, without enabled environment, our conditions will suffer. It's loss of job opportunities, it's loss of uh, 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 education opportunities, and we continue to suffer in that way. So I'm hoping these spaces and this platform, uh, Talat, because you have small time, uh, I'm hoping we will continue to create these platforms to engage further. I look forward to engaging further even outside this process. Thank you so much, Steve. And um, since I've got you here, I am going to ask a question um, because we might as well make the, the most of the, our time with you and your expertise. Tell me, how do you think um, members and participants that are part of this conference and including Scotland as a nation can be better allies on um, uh, the, the uh, issue around ensuring that those from LGBTQI communities in the most marginalised communities in the Global South are given the platform, the the emphasis, the investment that they deserve. How do you how do you think? How do you challenge us to be better allies? I think the most important thing. Um, LGBTI people have been so resilient. Um, uh, you've seen fantastic organisations. I mean, even here for us uh, at the Commonwealth Equality Network, we have forty seven member organisations absolutely doing amazing work. Now, how does one become an ally 
to already a movement that is resilient, uh, but it's only few people who are doing this uh, human rights advocacy work, and they are human rights defenders that are also uh, uh, still vulnerable. So I think the first is to partner with these NGOs when we address social structural uh, barriers, uh, including uh, uh, in the agenda of climate change uh, for that matter. When we discuss developmental agenda, let's not disconnect human rights uh, uh, issue because it's part of it. But empowering uh, uh, LGBTI organization is also by creating space you have created an opportunity for us as a, 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 a South a, a organization to join into this conversation with your, yourselves here. We can share the space. You are not speaking on my behalf. And I believe that even my siblings will not be, uh, speak, uh, be spoken to, but rather they create space on the table, right? And at the same time, resources are needed for LGBTI organizations. So if we have opportunities to raise resources together or to fund the work that is done by human rights defenders, I think it's a, a something that we can achieve. But allies are, speak out. They don't see and they keep quiet because silence can rot injustice. So I believe your participants in this call, I believe your friends in this call will help us to bring out the big agenda of fighting decriminalization and ensuring inclusive agenda, even in the climate change. Hugely important, and it's, it's a challenge for all of us. You know, active bystanders is, is critical. You said there that it's not to see something and stay silent. It's to voice the, the, the reality, to speak up and say um, as nations, as individuals, as organizations and campaigners that we will not stand idly by whilst this happens. And if I can just, um, because you're, you're, everything that you've talked about, and I've been reading your um, biography as well, um, and I, I didn't get a chance to do that when I introduced you, so I do want to let people know that you're the chair in Commonwealth Equality Network, an inclusive network that promotes cooperation, understanding and solidarity among diverse LGBTI plus organisations to collectively defend the rights and equality of LGBTI plus people throughout the Commonwealth. You're a founding director of Access Chapter 2, which works to protect and promote the human rights of LGBTQI people, women and girls in South Africa. You have a phenomenal um, uh, background and expertise. Um, and, and on that matter, to what extent do you think climate climate uh, justice conversations um, and solutions are investing in understanding the consequences of climate change for marginalized communities, specifically for the LGBTQI community. To what extent investment, do you think investment is being put into understanding the consequences of climate change for that community? Um, you know, our environments are changing. I'll give you an example of what has happened over the last few years uh, with uh, 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 our friends and siblings in the, in, in, in the Americas. Um, you know, there were serious uh, hurricanes that took place uh, in some of the small islands of the Caribbean, uh, which then meant people uh, have lost homes, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, they've lost their belongings and so forth. Uh, and it's a challenging environment to be in. Uh, uh, we have established uh, the Africa Caribbean uh, Pacific uh, 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 um, collaboration, also linking to the Konota Agreement uh, that is signed with the European uh, uh, community. Uh, in this, we wanted to even monitor how much money is going into the response, and it's part of that. Now, if we're going to be talking about climate finance and how climate finance really speaks to the realities of people, you then look at what goes into development, what goes into government to govern, also to coordinate, but also what goes to programs of priority for that matter. This speaks to us, it's our lives, it's our livelihood. And if my home and if my island or country is sinking, we have to realize that we see what is happening in uh, Fiji, in Solomon Islands, in, in Van, uh, Vanuatu. We see what is happening. And, and I think there's been exceptional good practices uh, of partnership to really address uh, different islands, organizations, countries coming together to build support and build climate resilience. And I think investment that must go to building climate resilience 
but also enhance good decision making uh, 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 processes will will help us to drive the finance better. But the last point I want to raise, uh, Talat, uh, for me, our governments are not an island. Uh, uh, and they must make the right decisions that are informed by the people, by their own citizens. Because if you think that you are not going to consult you know, the communities and you are making decisions for them, you are deciding how much you're going to spend people's money without consulting them. And that for me will represent lack of accountability. So governments must be held accountable, but also governments can be seen as partners where we can all come together to really invest on a, a climate resilience. So I am, I'm of the belief that once you have climate resilience, you then would have climate action that everybody can contribute to. You made an excellent point there about participation and accountability. Um, and, it, and governments making decisions based on lived experience, based on the, the, the people of a nation, rather than um, something that is, is coming directly from uh, a privileged few. We're talking a lot across nations, across the world, we talk a lot about better participation method, methods, better democratic methods. What do you think needs to happen to enable competent participation and that partnership working with governments, which right now seems very top down? Um, the conversation is happening for you, not with you. How do we change that? Yeah, but I think it exists in many spaces. Um, and, and I think the disconnect um, that we are seeing and the inequalities that exist between the global north, the global south, um, and even if there's solidarity amongst each other, there's still a power dynamics that we have to reflect in, right? Uh, uh, and, and we cannot run away who funds the climate agenda. Uh, many of our governments can't afford to even fund their own climate agenda uh, 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 programs, right? And, and then there's a whole dependence of, 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 of uh, uh, the Western countries to support that. But at what cost? Because some support comes at a cost. So a kind of bilateral agreement, there's a takeaway as well. So, and, and, and you can't take away when you speak about climate change because it affects everybody. What you throw in the ocean will not even be stuck only in Durban. It will go as up as uh, 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 in Indian uh, Ocean or Pacific Island. So we don't realize the impact that how the solidarity, whether global, not global, south speak to one another. But I think we've seen some few years ago when uh, um, you know, there were development of uh, uh, climate action enhancement packages. And I think these are things where you then saying, are they working? Who's part of conversations? Uh, can we consult? Can we agree? This is the program that is marrying every stakeholder. But every stakeholder that may be seated in the table might not be necessarily be the ones that are educated in managing and controlling the climate. We need a mass literacy, mass education drives in society because the damage that happens with littering, the damage that happens with oils, with everything around our environment happens in the ground. They don't happen at the helicopter level. They really happen at the ground. So for me, when you then regard the role of civil society, you can say to civil society organization, please drive the communication, please drive the social behavior change, drive the education uh, 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 production. And that's a capacity we need to build because for some of us, if our government is not spending and budgeting on it, chances of us thinking about the climate from that broad-based uh, point of view, are we going to lose that out? So even how we then say government, your responsibility is not to dictate, it's also to implement the right uh, and enforce laws that controls whether it's ammunition, whether it's all of that. So, so I think for me, the strategy must be very clear, but the strategy must be multi-sectoral. That's how we're going to win the agenda in this case. That's an excellent call for action, particularly around um, the need for education and the education across society, but also the education on the realities of climate change for our decision makers, because many of them are not well versed on the reality of what's happening to um, people 
on the ground. They're, they're, they're far away from the realities of, of climate change of a lot of people. Um, I just want to give you an open, well, I know you had some slides that you were going to show us and just to let everybody know, we're going to put the slides on the platform so you can go through that and they can still benefit from your expertise, even though we didn't have a chance today. So those will still be on the platform. But just as a kind of final, are there any key messages that you want to get across to our audience and our participants, key messages that they need to take home about what they can do next um, and about learning from your expertise really? I think I think for for me, the, the, the there's a really serious need of applying uh, 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 rules of engagement. You know, many governments, many countries have de developed you know uh, democratic principles, which also means that their laws are getting better. Some bit of laws are, are needs to change. We know that because it's about equity and applying an equality form that is benefiting everybody. Myself as a black lesbian woman, you know, it means so much to be in an environment that cares and nurtures me so that I can also contribute into, into, into the space. And I speak also with privileges because here in South Africa, just the last six months, we've lost over 20 LGBTI people brutally murdered just because they are gay, they are lesbian. So you can just imagine their vulnerability, the environment they lived in and so forth. So for me, we have to ensure that we have accountable governance everywhere. We have to understand the rule of law does matter. And even when we speak about climate, climate alone is it's not just alone. It's socially influenced. It's, it's uh, uh, influenced by many of us. And part of it is that the climate, we are the beneficiaries of a very good climate environment. And we have to then deliver back an equity or equitable part that contributes to a very healthy climate space. But I absolutely, the social component does really matter for that. So I would say that we are here as the Commonwealth Equality Network. We work very hard as human rights advocate. We need you as partners to also just uh, collaborate with us. And we need you to also contribute to building capacity within many other countries that suffer and don't have necessary resources uh, to collaborate. So this space does matter, but change matters when all of us are in it. Steve, thank you so much. I'm so glad we had the opportunity to benefit from your expertise and your input and your inspiring remarks. And um, so thank you for persevering and um, getting connected with us. I really appreciate it. And can I really recommend that those who are in the audience go and find out more about the Commonwealth Equality Network, find out how what allyship actually looks like from your position and what we can do to amplify those voices. Just as a reminder, uh, we will try and put slides up on um, Steve's slides up on the um, uh, online platform, and you will be able to access everything up until February 2022. Um, I'll just finish off by saying you do have a survey that's um, uh, for your feedback that's available on the platform. The link um, is also shared with you via platform notification that you can find. Um, and remember, there's also the Alliance Conference quiz that you can find on the top of the um, agenda, where the agenda, discussions, etc. Uh, tabs are. Uh, don't forget the Alliance Conference quiz. Um, and also you can find out uh, more about the sessions that are taking place. There are sessions this afternoon, so please do still engage. Engage with our sponsors and exhibitors and enjoy the rest of the conference. Although this is a formal closing plenary, it is not the end of the day. There's more to come. I'd just like to finish off by saying a huge thank you to Scotland's International Development Alliance for the privilege of being able to host to the last uh, two days. I've had the opportunity to learn so much from the experts speakers and from the questions that you have provided in the audience. A huge thank you to everybody in the background that helps out in making these um, events happen from the tech team and the online platform through to exhibitors, sponsors and you, the audience, for engaging and not just letting it be me as privilege of the chair asking questions that I want to know about. So I really appreciate that time. What's critical here is taking away the message of the conference. How do we thread together climate justice, well-being and well-being economies and equity and equality for social justice. These things do not exist in isolation from one another. They all need one another for us to be able to meet our ambitions for a fairer, um, safer, uh, equitable world for climate change. So a huge thank you to you all and I hope you, you continue to engage in this beyond just these two days. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm.